Hello, everybody. Welcome to our new episode of the Ferzuha Project. This is Aran. I am an educator of philosophy based in Austin, Texas. Today, I will have a conversation with my great friend, Trent. Hello, Trent. Hi, everyone. And this is your friend, Trent. I am a cultural historian of early middle of Europe and late medieval China. It's great to be with you all today. Uh, I am looking forward to this conversation. So we are uh, in the process of, uh, we, we have had episodes on uh, Hegel's uh, reason in history, his uh, introduction to the lectures and, and the world history. And uh, we have talked about Hegel's conception of uh, human nature, how uh, we think Hegel thinks about human nature and how he thinks about the relationship between um, human beings and other animals and the, the role of self-conscious agency um, in what makes us human beings. And we have also uh, talked about um, the relationship between history and philosophy um, in Hegel's thought and how uh, it is uh, different from other thinkers such as Kant that think of self-conscious agency um, as centrally as Hegel thinks of self-conscious agency. But also we have also we have seen the the fact that um, there is still a hierarchy between history and philosophy in Hegel's account. And what we think is the core cause of that is that the conception of human nature or what human nature as a concept is itself is not a business of philosophy, meaning that history is paramount in um, making it possible to articulate what a human nature is. It is also paramount in making uh, human nature and self-conscious agency as something more than mere a concept, but history is not creating human nature. History is not changing human nature that we come back, you know, a million years from now, million years is many, many years, but you get the point. Uh, and suddenly human nature is not self-conscious agency. There is no such a possibility. And that's just like a random extreme example uh, to kind of make the point, but that's the point. History, there is no point in history that uh, anything basic about human nature is gonna change, about its, its expression is gonna change. Um, it's um, the way it manifests itself in a, in a space is gonna change. Uh, but the the the, a, the concept of agency itself is not going to change, um, and we're going to talk about uh, all this in a more critical fashion when we um, will get to that point. But we also discussed that like with this history for Hegel will have a shape that there is a sense of continuity in history. Like even though there are nations with different principles and there is a sense of self enclosed uh, existence for each of them. Uh, they, they get connected somehow. Uh, and that con con connection is that they're all manifestations of the same human nature to different degrees. And that also means that for Hegel, culture uh, is not transformative when it comes to, um, you know, basic, maybe baseline of human uh, nature. Uh, by that, uh, we mean that culture does not create a history within history that is both philosophically relevant and also uh, irrelevant to the point about development of self-conscious agency as Hegel understands it. Um, cultures get transformed, cultures experience transformation in articulating human nature, but none of them is able to uh, set up a new chain that is not about self-conscious agency anymore, but it still is about something uh, essential to humanity, right? It's uh, the, the point about self-conscious agency doesn't doesn't go away. And we, we, we talked about the, the, the nature of this concept of nation and how Hegel thinks that proper nations create states and proper states are only possible with religious presuppositions, while religion is understood as something much broader than, uh, you know, whatever, dogmatic but divine commandments uh, it's it's a far a broader concept and that's a, that's that's something in Hegel's uh, idea that um, we um, we are willing 
to explore more. Um, now, what we're going what we're going to do today is that based on all of these points that Hegel uh, uh, brings up, who is not part of history, or who is part of history, uh, but not in a philosophically relevant way, or what which nations are part of history? They have contributed something to. Uh, this articulation of human nature, um, but they're in the state of comma or they're they're dead. They're, they don't they don't exist anymore. Um, and with with a with a view with a rather clear view of this uh, quote unquote outsiders of history, uh, we can better understand who is inside, which uh, which is going to be part of what we're going to talk about and next time. But before we get started, Trent, anything about this summary? No, let's just get started. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So the the point that like the way that Hegel talks about this is to say, or the, the assessment is whether a nation is world historical or not. So there are definitely nations in Hegel's view that there are nations, but they are not um they, they just don't contribute anything at the world historical level. I think what is interesting there is that I think Hegel could accept that, uh, you know, maybe there was a, a, a nation once that uh, without having much of a coherent ethical and political organization in Hegel's words, uh, was able to do something innovative technologically, right? And maybe another nation picked that up. And the second nature, the nation that picked that up, maybe a world historical nation. And the first nation was kind of contributing to the existence of the second one. But only second one is what matters in terms of the articulation of human um, nature. Which is interesting to me because I think there are, and when we get to the point about India, I think it becomes very clear that saying that a nation is not world historical or is only world historical in a very limited way doesn't mean that it doesn't have achievements. It just means it's not doing a certain thing, right? And sometimes Hegel calls this, um, like, or associates this with obscurity. He writes, Nations whose consciousness is obscure or the obscure history of such nations are at any rate, not the object of the philosophical history of the world, right? So this obscurity, um, of course, there is, uh, there could be many ways that consciousness of a nation could be obscured. And, and we are gonna, we're going to look at a couple of uh, uh, options there, uh, but the point is that there are nations who really do not have very clear principles, um, and they don't have a very clear kind of political organization. And they might have there. There are people. They're living. They are interacting. But they, that doesn't, they don't get connected. They don't, they don't join this club of nations that belong to the world historical um, structure. Um, and it is interesting to, to think that if, if a nation doesn't belong to the world history, right, meaning that it does not um, contribute directly to the articulation of human nature in sociopolitical institutions, then what is it? What is it to be outside history, right? Because I think from what, what Hegel, the way Hegel understands this, this point about being out of history has nothing to do with um, universal time for the lack of better terms. Meaning that there are societies right now that Hegel, if Hegel was alive, he would have said these are not world historical uh, nations. Um, Although it's, it has gotten much harder because of like, you know, the interconnectedness of the global economy, maybe. 
maybe that boundaries between nations is not as clear as Hegel uh, thought it, it was. But I'm sure if if Hegel, um, uh, you know, Hegel's interest in like, for instance, the state and unified kind of principles of the state, like what is Somalia, right? Like if, if we have a country that really has a failed state, like Haiti, right? The, the state is not really, um, is not really there in a very strong way. What, what is this then, right? And I think Hegel's point there would be that this could be an interesting object of study for like sociology, right? It could be interesting to see like how human psyche works in those conditions, but this doesn't tell you anything about what we are um, to at, at our core, right? Which is again, going back to that hierarchical thinking about what is what matters an expression of humanity, because someone could show up and say that the psychological expression of humanity when there is no state is very much determining our human nature, right? That's actually the, 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 the thing that we really are. And the rationality part is just some, you know, uh, as Werner Herzog said, civilization is a thin ice in the uh, in a sea of chaos. Um, we are more than more the chaos than the kind of the ruled version that we usually see. Um, but for Hegel, insofar as human nature has been understood as self-conscious agency, that doesn't matter. That is not, that's irrelevant. Um, and he writes, those periods which elapsed in the life of nations before history came to be written and which may well have been filled with revolutions, migrations, and the most violent changes have no objective history precisely because they have no subjective history. That is, no historical narratives. That also is something very important. Keeping track, keeping records, having some sense of memory, having some memory that is being transmitted to the to the later times. So for that reason, like, you know, the point about, you know, this kind of a myth about like Atlantis or something that just like there was this high, highly sophisticated civilization that just went submerged at some point. For him, well, that's just, it doesn't matter. What what matters is that it didn't it, it didn't have a contribution. Like if it's lost, if it's it's lost, and if it has been transmitted something to the to the to the rest of the world history, then sure. Um, but if not, that's that's out of the game. Uh, I'm also interested in Hegel's emphasis on written historical narratives as opposed to like, uh, you know, morally transmitted memories in the forms of like, you know, epic poems, right? And I'm not sure if this point about uh, like written history, how essential Hegel thinks it is. Like, what is it about written history as opposed to uh, oral history is it just a matter of keeping track? Is it just a matter of ac accuracy? Like what, what are we looking for when we're looking at um, in the, um, the form that history is um, recorded? In any case, Hegel is not denying that in these spaces, a lot of fascinating, interesting, violent, beautiful things happen. They're not relevant philosophically because they're not they're not part of that contribution system um they're not they're not really contributing to um articulating human nature uh, in any significant way yes i that was some quite a few things to say i tried to organize them into two things two points which share the same it's not necessarily a critique. It's a way I try to think aloud and gather feedback from you and from our listeners. So for me, I think Hegel here kind of takes, there's a fundamental assumption of perfect tr transparency, a point we already um, encountered in um, science of logic when determination and the constitution, some things that there can be no gap. And if you have that as your determination, um, 
factor or whatever, like others would receive that constitution from this specific something. I think that influences Hegel's understanding of two things. One is um, what qualifies as a nation to be what historical, and the second is precisely what you mentioned, the orality and versus the written records thing. Um, I'll, I'll go to the first one first. Is Hegel's argument about historical significance is very much still alive with us. If you go to like bookstores, new cultural histories, it's essentially trying to uh, arguing for the historical significance of an episode in the remote past and the distant place on its relevance to our current living condition. So for instance, um, this is very dominant in the history of a science. Like there's scholars saying we should pay attention to like um, medieval Islamic astronomy because our contemporary astronomy is from Renaissance Europe, which ultimately from like Islamic in the medieval achievement. And we should pay attention to like 10th and 11th century Central Asia Buddhist development because our scientific method, that reasoning came from there. So it's history is in, in a sense autobiography, but in Hegel is more subtle. It's that auto, that self thing is articulated as a human nature. What he values is presented as a universal principle. So the relevance or is articulated in the first quote that the basic M have embodied a universal principle, i.e. what I considered important for a modern state or a society. Therefore, that's the first point I have. Second is this perfect transparency of the determination that the constitution thing when applied to um, the analysis of history also determines um, accessibility itself is it guarantees um, Hegel's evaluation. For instance, Hegel never, in my reading at least, uh, contemplates the possibility that a society or a nation has already achieved, say, freedom, whatever, how, however he defines, but condemned or rejected that perfect transparency, that um, written records are ignored even though they had very sophisticated like uh, intellectual capability and uh, social achievement to keep track but uh, out of whatever cultural preferences for, for instance they try to limit the power of like bureaucrats that they chose not to set the most important things the in writing and subjugated that technical bureaucratic writing underneath orally transmitted epic and religious like truth. And this is not a hypothetical case. It is the case of India that we have all kinds of evidence to prove that like they had access to written words, but the most important knowledge were transmitted inside a situation where written words is per uh, prohibited from entering. And for Hegel, that's not a possibility. If a nation has already developed that perfect desire for um, perfect articulation, then certainly that written record, a certain form of article accountability would be desired. Hence, we as like 19th century um, um, philosophers would have perfect access to their thinking process, even though this reality is not the case. And I think both what, what I just said, one is autobiography relevance, the second is about accessibility. Both are connected, I think, in his fundamental assumption about transparency of a something's sort of expression of like determination and a reception of like a constitution from them. There can be no gap. That's like, of course, there are multiple jumps there, but I, uh, such interpretation at least makes sense to me at this level. I'm open to your like challenge or anything. Yeah, I think that's 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 very interesting, and I think it's it's very much related to like the the obsession almost with um, transparency and you know bringing everything to the light. It gets intertwined with that kind of interest in articulation, right? 
you know, I think we had this struggle at the very, very beginning of um, science of logic, that it seems like that from the very beginning, there is only a certain type of articulation accepted as something valid um, in, in the system, right? It's like that if, if someone says that like I think about being as whatever, sheer immediate, um, just givenness. And their response to that is just, they just start, you know, jumping and dancing. That's not an answer. That's not a move. That's that's like, you know, it's like a game of chess. That's not a valid move, right? It's not that it's a bad move. It's, a, it's not, it's an invalid move. And I think there is something similar here in terms of not having a written articulated version of history and like confining yourself to oral history, not caring about history, uh, thinking about history and poetry is very much intertwined. All of those are just invalid points. They're, you're disqualified from the game. It's not that you are bad at the game, you're just disqualified. Um, and that just basically just, you know, uh, the point about like being out of history. And of course, there, he, he recognizes uh, you know, a, a continuum there. But uh, yeah, it seems like that he has a very um, uh, kind of, he sees a very direct relationship between um, transparent recorded articulation and uh, the ability to exist in like, you know, uh, in, in a free society, right? So here we are not even challenging Hegel's point about whether freedom in the form of actualized self-conscious agency is, you know, part of human nature is universal, should be universal, whatever. But even if it is, there is something interesting about thinking that that will always come. What what if like a society that's achieved that decides that oh this history is now just a burden, just like it's just like burn it all. Uh, we can just do it. We can just go for it. Um, like, what is the, like, how is that, a, a, like, or, or couldn't we, like, imagine a society that, uh, like, reads Hegel, like, Hegelian readers, and they go about and create a little country in the middle of jungle that is just, uh, you know, it's a country. It has representation, it has a judicial structure, it has anything, but it has no interest in contact with anyone, and it's not interested in recording its history. It's just like they're, they're doing it uh, in a different way. Like, what is that? Is that a society that's achieved freedom? Or there is something about this articulation, connection, transparency, being out there, being like, you know, getting the recognition of like other nations as something that is essential to it. Um, in any case, whatever Hegel thinks about that, he seems to have a very important um, interest in written history and having the state that is organized based on uh, certain principles. Uh, and otherwise he, he thinks this is, uh, this is not uh, part of the history proper. And this kind of leads us to the point that Hegel makes about um, Chinese and Indian civilizations, right? And Chinese and Indian civilizations are part of Hegel's discussion. Right, they're not, as you mentioned last time, part of those you know areas of the world that they're just and that's... Away. yeah, just like they're they are not even uh, they're not even considered as part of the history. But uh, although Hegel uh, includes uh, China and India, um, he has a very interesting take on what kind of nations they are. And why that characteristic is um, substantial in not thinking of those civilizations as uh, advanced uh, when it comes to self-conscious agency, right? He, he writes, it's a rather long uh, quote, but I think it's important to kind of speak out um, uh, uh, parts of it at least. He says that, yet these two nations, China and India are lacking in the essential self-conscious concept of 
a self-consciousness of the concept of freedom. The Chinese look under moral rules as if they were laws of nature, positive external commandments, coercive rights and duties, or rules of mutual um, courtesy. And he, he continues. Um, uh, the, the fact that these two, I'm just looking for one um, part of it. Um, like the moral writings of the Stoics, he, he writes, um, they read like a series of commands which purport to, to be necessary for the attainment of happiness, so that it is left to the individual to adopt and follow such commands or not. In the same way, the idea of an abstract subject, the wise man, is a culmination of such doctrines with both the Chinese and a Stoic moralist. So the, the idea is that the the I in the case of China, and we're going to get to India as well, but in in any case, the the there is no real like noticing of subjectivity, and that really shows itself in thinking of moral rules as some kind of natural commandments. Um, and that is a theme that, especially in Terry Pinkbar's Does History Make Sense, uh, uh, pops up. And the theme is the fact that you cannot think about this actualization of human nature without, without starting to think about the differentiation between what is human created, what is human created and necessary, what is human created and arbitrary, and what is just merely natural. And I think for, for someone like Hegel, what happens in the, in, a, in the Chinese society is that the moral codes, the moral statutes are understood to be part of nature. The roles of social roles of individuals are given. Uh, and I think there is a less lack of ability to collectively consider, like consider that this role attribution is our making, and it, subjectivity is at play in all of these things. And because subjectivity plays at all of these things, then let's recognize subjectivity at all its layers, right? And because none, nothing of that kind happens in, in the Chinese civilization, um, something important about actualization of human nature is dormant. Um, in the Chinese. And here, um, the same idea applies to India with, with, with a different emphasis. That Hegel says it is obvious to anyone with even a rudimentary knowledge of the treasures of Indian literature that this country, so rich in its spiritual achievements of a truly profound quality, nevertheless has no history. Right? And this idea of lack of history um, gets intertwined with this inability to recognize even minimally um, or barely um, subjectivity. And one last thing that I, I, I want to say here, um, maybe the second to last, one, one brief point is that the point here is not so much about whether Hegel is wrong about China or India, um, empirically, but whether if his imagined China and India exist, does he make sense, right? That he does his argument uh, um, fall in, into place. But I think that the idea here kind of goes back to what we discussed in past episodes in terms of how Hegel understands nature. For, for Hegel, nature keeps repeating itself. Nature doesn't really move anywhere. And there are differences that pop up, but differences are just like within that confinement um, of uh, nature. Every lion is a new lion, but every lion lives like a lion. And there's no real connection to anything that could be called culture or cultural memory, any response to that. Any form of memory is just biological memory. Right, just like a stone has only geolog ge ge uh, geological memory, but human beings have something like cultural memory, and that cultural memory is necessarily for Hegel must include realizing the tension between 
um, many things, but one of them is this kind of self-conscious agency and our natural side. And I think that's what he thinks is going to be a tension that is present in many historical, world historical um, spheres. If that tension is not present or suppressed or accepted as resolved in this way that everything is natural, no history, only repetition. So you keep repeating what you're doing. Now, the, this bureaucrats die, new bureaucrats come. This uh, dynasty goes, this new dynasty comes, but it's just like a new lion is like in charge of. Like there is no real difference because subjectivity, if subjectivity is not recognized, history becomes past. History just becomes something that just happened. Um, and now let's do it again. Let's just, let's just do that natural thing that we always do. Um, and let's just do it. It just, it doesn't have that kind of a relevance um, in terms of self-knowledge in a very basic sense. And I think that self-knowledge is something that Hegel thinks is essential um, for philosophically relevant history. Oh, yes. Um... I don't know how to respond to the first slide because um, I was really thinking hard, like how to think with Hegel, whether this is two specific cases. Of course, like as you said, I totally agree. We are not really examining either Hegel as like making correct empirical assessment of the two nations or to what extent that his assessment was truthful to the information he had at his time, which by the way was just with the translation of certain like uh, Chinese classics, the pre-imperial classics into Latin in the 18th and 19th century. And for India, he had better access because like German scholars, philologists especially were really interested in Sanskrit connection with say Greek at, at that time. Um, and Hegel himself is definitely really diligent readers. He was trying his best to understand, no doubt of that. But his information was outdated and incomplete. So what to make of this? I think a couple of things are, I think, are fruitful grounds for future, perhaps comparative civilization as a way um, to go, we do have such research projects going on in our time, usually under the uh, rubrics of like an um, axial age thesis that like uh, modernity was invented in this specific time in Eurasia, essentially, which includes both China and India. And a lot of uh, um, more sympathetic readers and examiners try to put, say, um, the rise of Judah Christianity and Greco Roman antiquity, like uh, the classical China and the Indian antiquity, on the same platform and examine their um, intellectual achievements and, and their relevance to contemporary world. I think everything still comes back to the first thing we mentioned in this theory, uh, series, namely Hegel's purpose of doing history. That is to discern the progress of the forward spirit, which, like his the understanding of the human nature, is fixed. It does not take new information. So no matter how sympathetic, how knowledgeable he becomes about, say, different stages of the Chinese or Indian civilization, it would not really change his desire to demonstrate that, or conviction to a certain extent, that freedom is the only thing that really matters in the building of a social like um, institutions to allow human beings, the individual or a collective, to be more conscious and more able to, to better articulate themselves. And if you fix this universal standard, uh, I would say um, his judgment of China and India is understandable. Yes, like it fits into the overall project. The question is for us whether when we are doing comparative history or civilization studies, shall we follow that uh, assumption or what kind of assumption will we use um, in this stat? Shall we maybe say, instead of see one unified principle, like pursue for freedom, we have 
one for each civilization. That's essentially axial age argument. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's some tentative reflection. And also the second thing is his a treatment of these two civilizations invites a question or my curiosity about individual agency because I'm sure even he himself was aware like there were diverse voices within each traditions, some of which are very much against the holistic turning everything, for instance, China, turning everything into a moral subject. So you have Taoist writers, you have like um, legalist writers, what, what have you. And Hegel was aware of their existence. But apparently for him, those, the individual descendants were incapable of expanding what a civilization or national spirit was ultimately about. Like they belong to this collectivity. And this collectivity itself is but a chain or a stage in the development of world history. If you deviate from the like neatly assigned hierarchic rule, um, then it's irrelevant because it doesn't prove the point. Even you have voices which very much close to, to say, I don't know, Islamic thinkers in China, or even to like Roman uh, jurists that argue, or even God forbid the Prussian. Prussian theologians understanding of individuality oh it doesn't matter because it's not the defining characteristics of what he had in mind as a China or India where it would history would just become endless enumeration of um, uh, um out layers instead of providing a, like very neat compact and a convincing account of the triumph of, of freedom and what kind of social systems that are necessary for it to be in place. I think there is certain pedagogical or even, I don't like the term ideological, but value considerations behind his selection and um, filtering of information. So that's, that's, that's what I got basically. Yeah, and I think it's interesting to, like there are a couple of interesting things there, like I think one thing that that your last point kind of brings out is like the point that we have uh, like discussed in different contexts before that which differences matter, right? So, and like the, you know the Taoist descent to like the you know whatever a uh, certain kind of way of doing things in China doesn't matter much in you know assessment that Hegel has of China it seems like 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 at what at what point we can make a judgment about Chinese civilization um and just like who is involved in that narrative of this is China right because you can take a history of any country and just like have a snapshot of very specific po points in your history and that history will be very different you know just then the, the, the exclusion matters in what you define as like the american like let's say like the what is america what kind of a state is america right like you you get very specific points in the american history and you think about america as this kind of like a world power trying to dominate every other state with like whatever capitalistic society and a specific type of a liberal democracy but like you know there was a point in america that was anti-imperialist and anti-expansionist to some extent at least just leaving the world alone um and in some ways very much like defender or something that now it seems that people would consider be against what it's doing right now which america like it, when you're thinking about like the America and America is like a 300 year old, it's nothing right? compared to China, which is like thousands of years. So it seems like in terms of like a judgment, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting that it's how he kind of forgets about all of those things. But it is also interesting that I agree with you that even if he gets like all the nuance in the world about Chinese civilization, I think the best it can get is that he will recognize far more subjectivity 
um, in Chinese history than he actually uh, realized. But something else doesn't happen. The Chinese civilization will not change his conception of human nature. I think that that's the that's something that is very important for us. There is no cultural development that changes the conception of human nature. Uh, in that sense, culture is additive to self-conscious agency. It's not transformative. Uh, it's not that, oh, just like the same way that we say that, oh, we are animals, lions are animals, but being a self-conscious animal puts you in a completely new category, right? It, the same thing doesn't happen with culture. It's not that, okay, we're all self-conscious agents, but being cultured in X, Y, Z way makes you this type of self-conscious agent that is categorically different from self-conscious agency in general, right? There is no such potential in culture. There is no such potential in history. And because of that, human nature is um, just by the beach relaxing when all of this analysis is happening. Like it's not being bothered. There is no thunder coming and disrupting its uh, peace and stability. It's the same and the same and the same. Uh, and I think that's that's just uh, that's just very very interesting. Um, in in general, uh, one last thing though that I think to to Hegel's defense, I think he could like he definitely can recognize that a nation has a different set of values and has a different set of um, you know priorities. I don't think he has a problem with that. I think he, what he says is that all of those values that um, different nations put forward for themselves uh, ultimately must resolve the problem of subjectivity. Like the problem of subjectivity is not a problem that you cannot solve. That, that's, I think, what he has in mind. I think that's how I approach it. Um, and that would take away all the points about human nature and all of that to an extent, um, or makes them a little bit less uh, assertive. That problem of subjectivity and problem of subjectivity in contrast with the naturally given aspects of humanity is something is a problem that is going to hunt you. You, you cannot you cannot really get rid of it, mm -hmm. right? And I think it it, it kind of translates itself in in the in another question: What kind of norms should we pick, right? What kind of norms are necessary? What kind of norms are are the ones that we should pick? And for Hegel, I think that and this is mostly uh, I think I'm borrowing this from Pinkhart that that's just like a very very basic conception of justice that these are the the norms and this is the just way to do things. Uh, I think Hegel says that, of course, not all, every nation will go ahead and say that we want freedom, right? That's definitely not something, um, uh, something universal. But every nation will go ahead and say these are the norms that make sense, right? And by that, it implies that here is justice. This is. By saying that these are the norms that make sense, it says that we have found justice. And I think Hegel thinks that the answer to the tensions coming from claims of justice only get resolved when freedom is actualized. Freedom is the answer to the question of justice, and the question of justice is nothing but coming from asserting that these norms make sense. And in that sense, making sense and being free come together because making sense itself is nothing but expression of um, humanity, right? So I think Hegel is better equipped to deal with the problem of um, different goals in different nations. Um, then just saying that, okay, of course they have different goals, right? And of course they, there is no nothing universal at first glance. But I think there is something universal at a second glance if you realize that they're all trying to make sense. And I think making sense 
is for Hegel a problem, like embedded in the question of making sense practically is the question of human subjectivity. Uh, now, I agree with you that maybe assuming that there is one solution to the question of subjectivity um, is a problem. But I think that at least puts Hegel in a different place um, than just saying that I picked this random value and now all of you must be subjugated um, uh, based on that. Um, it makes the point of it, point of it a little bit more basic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. I, I didn't say, I think, like, ran, uh, freedom is a random topic, like, term, well, value for Hegel. It was very much connected with subjectivity, as you said, and also with human nature, which is universal. If you are convinced that your understanding of that specific human nature holds for all human societies, then you are, of course, motivated to, to apply the natural conclusion in your logic system, in this case, freedom to all those. That's why I agree. I just, I don't know what, yes, I agree. This is, he's, he's better equipped than um, like ardent and, un, and unapologetic uh, cultural relativism. We are all just different. Um, I think he, he provides more interesting, but just by submerging these um, superficial differences to a meta level of, say, subjectivity and lack of it, freedom and the lack of it, it does not necessarily solve the problem of like um, interpreting and like comparing cultures. So that's what I try to say. Yes. Yes, I I absolutely agree agree with that. Yes, definitely. Um, so one last thing that is necessary, not necessarily something new and uh, that I think we have covered most of things. It's just about like some connections and I think some even uh, like wordings of things that I find uh, fascinating here. And I, I believe uh, Pinkard mentioned this um, in trying to like decipher Hegel's view on China and India. And the way he understood the basic problem was that in those cultures, the imagined version of Hegel uh, that Hegel has from China and India, Zittlichkeit collapses into Zitte. Like ethical life ends up being just custom, which is just being some sort of a habit of a so societal habit. Um, and I think it's, in, it's interesting. Uh, that the, the idea is this, uh, it's not about not being rational, but it's about not being able to distance oneself, right? Which goes back to the whole idea of subjectivity and this idea that, um, as, as um, Pinkard writes, in Hegel's view, um, the Indians and Chinese are completely or almost absorbed um, or almost completely absorbed in their natural and social worlds have not yet worked their way out of that immersion. So they're too immersed, right? And I think it's, again, this is something that is uh, not just about, the, the important point here is not whether this is accurate about China and India, I think. It's about what does this tell us? What is this type of a society? Because I think about like a cultish, kind of a space. I think a cultish space is very much like that. It's, it's only immersion. Everything is zitte. Everything is just, and everything is presented as if it's a natural law. Like this is how, how things work, right? That's it. Um, and I wonder how much of this is actually could be uh, recognized within modern, modern states, right? How much of an immersed kind of a life we are living in a modern era that's supposed to be uh, kind of anti-immersion. And the, the second kind of concept that stood out with me um, was the point that uh, Pinkard mentions, does history make sense? That, quote, China cannot generate its own negativity. So its negation must come from something both external to it and indifferent to it. And this also made it interesting for me in terms of the parallel that exists between uh, this analysis and um, beginning of Hegel's logic, because in beginnings of Hegel's logic, 
uh, it's there is no escape from uh, having negativity embedded in in a something, right? And I think it's interesting to think about uh, the inability to recognize negativity uh, at at a higher, more complex way. Um, that even though the potential of a negative negativity exists, the negativity never becomes actualized um, in certain cultures, or the way that it becomes actualized, it's it's not. Uh, it's not the same as the others. And how in Hegel's view, this will be compatible with that basic thing about like being being intertwined with negation, right? In what sense that uh, a nation could exist, could be without negativity. And isn't that uh, a contradiction, a logical contradiction on Hegel's part uh, or not? Trin? Yes, I I agree with your point. It's just um I don't yeah I don't think I don't know whether in Hegel's logic any national spirit that could achieve that self-challenging or like self-overcoming to a certain extent entirely on its own, which seems as you said quite different from the impression I got from reading like in the beginning part of the science of logic that they are all interconnected as something and other so like shouldn't this logic also apply to say culture exchange yeah that's just the question I was thinking yeah yeah I think I think that's our like I'm for those those listeners that are not familiar with uh, Hegel's science of logic that's absolutely fine the idea to, for us is that Hegel's sense of logic starts from like kind of like uncovering being at a very, 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 very fundamental way. And we keep wondering in our conversation whether what is that, right? What is it to kind of uncover logic of being? What is it to be? And then how that like uncovering of that, granted that it's all accurate, uh, gets applied to different domains of existence, right? That like is the being of a peach uh, at that very very basic level of following the same logical structure that the being of China, and is this the same type of a being? And I can think that it is either is or not. If it is things start to get weird in a certain way, right? That the being of a species becomes equal to being of an individual, but a species and individuals, individual organisms are different categories. And that's just like, that's very different in important ways. And that, that just conflates them. Um, and if they are not, like this is not about being in general, then what is it? Like if it's not about being that is applicable to any being, um, then what what are we talking about? How could we even think about uh, like logic of being? It seems like that we cannot think about logic of being unless we first determine what type of a being we are thinking, uh, and that will that will change the whole science of logic completely. It's not um, it's not gonna. Um, it's not going to be the same same type of book. Anyhow, um, I think we have talked about the um, out of history um, idea um, enough. We're going to end this uh, conversation right now. We're going to come back to probably the, the pivotal point in reason and history, which is concerned with the concept of the end of history. Um, and the end is has a double connotation. One end means goal, and the other it will it means just kind of kind of a resolution, maybe, um, that it kind of resolves itself. And we're going to tell you what Hegel thinks about that. And after that, we are going to tell you in a different episode or different episodes what we think might be going wrong with all of this. So with that, 
let's make this the end of this conversation. Yes, dear listeners, thanks for listening. Stay attuned. End of history is coming up. <laughs>